thank you. Um, great. Um, so uh, thanks to the organizers, uh, Doris, Blake, and uh, Tony. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun to be here. And the title of my talk is Space is a Sequence. Uh, and I have a very ambitious agenda here. Um, I want to show you that all these phenomena are the same. All these phenomena that you are seeing in the hippocampus are the same. In fact, including the most important phenomena, which is your next experiment, um, is going to be the same. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and I can explain all of that using this model called uh, clone structured cognitive graphs. Uh, that's, the, that's a claim. So I have a very ambitious agenda and very little time. So I'm going to just double down on my Indian stereotype and uh, talk really fast. Uh, and in case I fail, um, here, is the, here are the papers that you can go look back on to see what, what really happened. Um, OK, so we have a rat in a room. Um, so imagine you are the rat, and you get local observations. Um, and you just move in the room, you get local observations. Uh, and uh, you know uh, it's just uh, a sequence of gray, 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 um, then a bit of green, and your actions. That's all you get. Um, now, can you learn the layout of this room from this? You are just getting local observations, and uh, your action sequences, can you learn the layout of the room? There are, there's no Euclidean assumption you are allowed to make. Um, and uh, you get long sequence of uninformative blanks, grays, uh, during, in, in a blank room. Um, and if you just do a naive approach, uh, just learn a Markov chain, uh, first order, you, would, you can't do that. If you just do success representations on the input, you can't get that. Um, you, but if you use our model, CSCG model, you can actually learn the layout of the room. It, in fact, recovers it exactly. Uh, Here's a rat. For some reason, it's on a soccer ball and uh, running around uh, and uh, seeing local patches of observation. And again, it's a sequence of uh, patches that you're seeing. Um, CSCG will uh, recover uh, the, the ball. Uh, on a Rubik's Cube, uh, for some reason, the rat's running around. Uh, CSCG will uh, again recover the layout of the, of the room. Uh, we, you know, we, this transitive inference task is something uh, hippocampus uh, people are very interested in. Uh, you show A to B, then B to C, can you infer A to C? We have a fun version of that one. Suppose you have two rooms, two overlapping rooms, and the rat is running, allowed to run only in one room or the other, never across them. And to make it even more fun, you, you know, some of the overlapping patch kind of repeats in another room. Um, so now we can ask the question. So, you know, you, the rat is only seeing these two disconnected segments. Uh, and what does CSCG learn? If you l learn CSCG, it actually stitches the room back and, you know, gets the coherent thing, including placing the overlapping region uh, in two different places uh, perfectly. So what's the secret? So let me, let me give you what, what the secret here is. Um, so suppose you want to learn two sequences in the world. The world has only two sequences, A, B, C, and D, B, E. Um, if you do a first order Markov chain, it's terrible because you, it, you can now generate weird sequences. You can uh, generate A, B, E, or uh, D, B, C, uh, which do not occur in the world. Uh, so there is a trick you can use. Um, this is called the cloning trick. Uh, what you can do is, you know that you're losing context at B, you split B into two states, B and B prime, you rewire the connections to re respect the context they are coming from, and relearn the outgoing connections. This is a standard trick, actually, it's uh, invented in 1987, it's a compression uh, technique uh, called cloning. Um, and the import, and we have modernized that technique because we, now we have put it in a probabilistic framework and, uh, and, and uh, using more machine learning uh, techniques to learn it. Uh, so the cloning trick is creating a latent space. Those two different Bs are connected to the same observation, uh, but they are hidden. It's not like n-grams or higher order Markov change on the observation space. It's creating a latent space. So let me give you a mechanistic understanding of this space. Um, so here are um, five observations, A, B, C, D, E. Um, the first thing is you have to create clones. These, these are clones which are connected to um, the same observation. So these are all clones of A. Um, they are connected to the same observation. And they are clones of D, etc. And uh, now, so here is a uh, sequence. This sequence is actually B, A, B. Uh, you can read it off the graph because it's connected to a clone, then A, then B. Then here is A, B, um, then branching out to C or D. So it can be probabilistic branch out, branch in, et cetera. Uh, so that's the sequence. Uh, so there's BCD, uh, ACE, uh, so you get the idea. So you can create a lot of over overlapping sequences with repeated elements, et cetera, and store in this clone structured graph without, without losing context. Um, now let me show you how inference works in this graph. It's a probabilistic model. So here, suppose you, after having stored the sequences, you get the sequence A, B, uh, D, E. 
Um, so when A comes in, um, that's the first element, all these clones will be active using the bottom-up activation because it's directly connected to them. Uh, and then they, they will propagate their activations on these lateral connections. Um, and uh, then when B comes in, uh, the activity of the clones will be a combination of both the bottom-up activation and the lateral activation, and, and this will keep uh, going. Um, I have to click through a few slides here, I guess. Okay, um, so, uh, so this will keep propagating in the network. Um, so let me just uh, give you the uh, idea here. So if you look at the clone activations, it's a combination of two things. One is the direct bottom-up activation, and then there is the lateral activation coming through these lateral connections. So, and, um, and it's, a, it's a sum of them um, and normalized version um, and this is a, the exact probabilistic calculation if you do the computations in the log domain. So this is a probabilistic model, just trust me, and it's an exact inference, so there is no approximation, this, but this is what the actual calculation is. Um, and keep in mind that the model can accommodate graded activation, no problem, um, because it's probabilistic, and it can also deal with incorrect and noisy inputs um, because um, smoothing in the model will recover the correct latent state. And this whole model can be formulated, just the sequence learning part of it without the actions can be formulated as a special case of a hidden Markov model. It's basically saying all these hidden states are restricted to emit only this particular observation. So you can put it as a restriction on the emission structure of the hidden Markov model and that's how we learn the model. So now let me connect it to the, the uh, room learning tasks that I showed you earlier. Suppose you have uh, this room and you set up this um, uh, learning model, and so you have nine observations in the room. There are only nine different colors. That's what we are wired to, and you have set up the clones, um, and uh, each observation is hardwired to the same color. I'm not showing those connections, and initially the lateral connections are random. I'm not showing those connections, but now after learning, which is we use EM algorithm to learn these lateral connections, this is what the graph ends up being. Uh, this is the actual graph, um, and uh, that's the same as this graph, I just deleted the unused nodes. Uh, you can just re rearrange those graphs, and uh, uh, that's what it looks like. And uh, this, is, this is the graph that I showed you earlier. This is saying that this is the layout of the room. Um, now, I can ask the question, what does this uh, neuron or a clone respond to? Oh, it, you see, it responds to the gray color, right? That's what it responds to. That's why I put the color in there. What does this neuron respond to? It also responds to the gray color. but the important thing to mind is that each of them are responding to the gray color in that particular sequential context. So what is the gray sequential context here? So this neuron will respond to the rat moving in that particular sequence, or this sequence, or this sequence, etc. So any sequence ending up there, the, that the particular clone will respond to. And these are latent sequences. These are not observed sequences. These are latent sequences in the, in the model space, right? Uh, and um, so, so this is what the graph actually looks like. Keep in mind that there is no width, height, et cetera, in this graph. You know, you, you, uh, there is no location in this graph. This is what the rat learns. What this graph contains is really the ep compressed episodic experience of the, of the sequences. That's all that, that the, this thing contains. But now, as an experimenter, you might say, hey, I want to, I want to learn, do place fields. Uh, you know, I want to see what does this neuron respond to. For some reason, experimenters want to do that. Um, and this is called mapping the place fields. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to argue that almost all the phenomena that you see are just artifacts of doing this. So let's, let's do this, okay? Let's um, take this neuron and ask, what is the place field of this neuron? Um, so what we do is, we take the environment, we let the rat run in that environment, we draw a square which corresponds to that environment, we mark the spaces where things light up. That is the place field. Yeah, and it does correspond one to one to uh, this one. That is, that's just a coincidence. But, uh, but this is how we draw the place fields. Now you can ask the question: um, What will happen to this place field if I test the rat in an elongated room? Uh, now, if you keep this intuition of place field in mind, you will get confused. If you keep this one, you won't be able to think about it. But so you have to go back to this original graph and say, what will happen to this neuron, uh, its response, place field, if I elongate the room? So uh, let's do that experiment. We take the room, we elongate it uh, right here, uh, and we can do it because it's the same observation space. Uh, and you let the rat run in that room, uh, map the things, uh, mark the locations. So here's the quiz. What, uh, what, will it, what will the place field look like? If you have been paying attention, you should be able to simulate this in your head. The place will, will remap, and it will respect the boundary uh, distances. Um, and 
uh, we get remapping in relation to the boundary without having to have boundary vectors. So, and why does this happen? Um, so let me show you, you know, remember that that particular um, uh, clone neuron was responding to the sequential context. Now that sequential context will partially occur in two different places uh, in, that, in that new maze because, you know, like, you know, when it goes to a corner, it will think that's in a corner. And when it go, walks back, it will see that context again. So that's why the, the remapping happens. Uh, nothing related to space or vectors or anything. It's just purely temporal uh, context occurring, occurring in two different places. Um, and, you know, this, you can show a variety of remapping. And what you just did is recreate uh, this very, very classic paper on uh, geometric determinants of uh, place field remapping, but there is no geometry. Um, it's just uh, sequences. Um, in fact, uh, these place field mappings are responsive to the, the direction of travel. If the rat travels in one way, only one side of the lobe, uh, the, this remapping will happen. The, the rat travels in the other way, the, the other side will happen. And that's very clear in this picture. You know, this you, you can kind of simulate it in your brain. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's what. Um, it, 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 it explains it without having to try it too hard. Um, without, it just came out of the model. And the same mechanism will also explain landmark vector cells. I, I don't have to go through the details of it. It's, it's pretty much all, all you moved is you moved another thing that creates context. And, uh, and where, because of that, some trajectories the rat take will trigger where the context moved, and it will be in vector relationship to where it was moved, et cetera. But again, it's just sequential uh, context, um, OK? And we can reproduce um, Muller and uh, QB experiments. These are classic Muller and QB experiments where you put the rat in a circular room with a cue card on one side. Now you're asking the question, what will happen if you rotate the cue card? Or oh, the, the place will, will rotate because it's in the, the context moved. So, um, so it, will, it will rotate. Uh, and you can create pretty much all of them. So, uh, in, so what I'm basically claiming is that many of these fascinating looking phenomena which are all look puzzling but those puzzling all come from just you know deciding to plot the place field maps if you do not use a plate, you know those things are not puzzling anymore because you don't want to characterize those place field maps using some mathematical formula etc because that's kind of characterizing might be an epiphenomena um, and uh, in fact i'm going to say that all these x coding cells where x corresponds to boundary um, or landmark or any other thing that you can think about might all be just sequence learning pure and simple in fact these are the lists of papers that uh, we were able to kind of replicate without doing anything, um, without just running this model on a variety of settings in these things. Uh, don't worry, we haven't di done ev everything. I have left space for um, your uh, next experiment uh, right there. Um, OK, so, um, uh, so now uh, let me um, go to a, a more interesting question. Um, you know, here's a learned uh, CSCG. Uh, you know, we have learned in a particular room. Can we use that? to explore another room or understand another room um, with, a, with the same structure. So here, this new room has different observations. Instead of gray carpet, there's blue carpet. But it has roughly the same structure. It's a room with boundaries, et cetera. Um, so can we, can we do that? And uh, we can. We, what we do is, you know, so if you think of, about the model, there's this latent graph that is learned. And there is the way that latent graph makes contact with the world is through this emission matrix. That is what basically it takes the latent graph nodes and say these graph nodes belong to this observation. Uh, and, but this emission matrix can be changed. So if you take the emission matrix away, what, what, you're, what you have is a schematic graph. What does this schematic graph encode? It just encodes the idea that all these nodes which are the same are connected in this particular way. These other nodes which are also the same are connected in this particular way without filling in the content of that particular node. Right? It's, it's basically saying these are restricted to be the same, and though they are connected in a particular way. That's what it is encoding. And so then you can learn a new emission matrix in a new room. And this learning is super fast. It's, it's extremely fast. Uh, and uh, you don't have to even see the whole room. Sometimes you can just see part of the room, and it will, it will fill in the rest. Um, and, uh, so, and when you do that, uh, so a new set of colors can be filled into this schematic graph. So you can, you can ground the graph in a new environment using this uh, new emission matrix. So I'm going to argue that um, whenever you learn maps, uh, there is another process which is basically going to uh, look at all these maps and extract the schema uh, CSCG out of them. And all these CSCGs or, or schema graphs will be in your brain. 
Uh, of course, the schemas will be fewer in number compared to the number of maps you have seen because the same schema can map to many different maps. So, uh, and, and when you're exposed to a new environment, you are simultaneously trying to see, oh, can I map the new environment through any of the schemas that exist in the brain by, by labeling this emission matrix, which is extremely fast process, and also at the same time, uh, learning, a, trying to learn a new map, and you know there will be some competition between them, uh, etc. So, uh, so hopefully, I've convinced you that all these uh, different phenomena are all the uh, same, and it uh, can be explained using uh, pure uh, sequence learning. And uh, that's um, okay. And um, so, just just to give you an advice, this is the second last slide. This is all connected to a cognitive architecture that we are building um, in, uh, uh, at, at Vicarious. Um, we, we have been working on this for a few years. Um, I just want to give you a snapshot on like, you know, what are the different papers connected to that. One was the, this um, science paper that we published in 2017. It is a structured perception, generative perception model which has feedback, occlusion reasoning, object-based attention, et cetera. And there was a dynamics model which has object-based dynamics uh, uh, connected to that. Uh, there was a concept learning uh, thing which uses both the dynamics model and this science, uh, this CAPTCHA uh, paper um, to learn concepts as programs, as uh, abstraction on top of that. And kind of the second last step in that one uh, is the quantity maps and then we have to connect to language. That's the, that's the direction in which we are proceeding in using how, you know, how biological inspiration and uh, um, cognitive science, neuroscience, et cetera, can be brought together into, into a uni, you know, cognitive architecture. Doesn't mean that this, you know, this will work or you know, if the first iteration is the right idea, et cetera. We, we will keep iterating on these different pieces and also how it connects together. So if you want more information, you can uh, follow uh, us on Vicarious. Also, all the code for you know, everything that I uh, did here is available. Uh, so just follow uh, or Vicarious on Twitter or m follow me on Twitter because it's, I have the coolest um, Twitter handle there, um, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.